Hey, this is Joey Cape from Lagwagon. Uh, you're listening to Nate on The Vinyl Guide. See you soon, Australia. We're on our way. This episode is brought to you by VMGVinyl.com. Professional record cleaning, restoration, rejuvenation, and grading. Refresh your records with VMGVinyl.com. And with that, on with the show. Well, howdy ho, ladies and gentlemen. It's Nate with episode 419 of The Vinyl Guide. The podcast for record collectors and music nerds, and today we've got yet another hero of mine here on the show, Mr. Joey Cape, who many of you know is the founder of Lagwagon, Me First in the Gimme Gimmies, Bad Astronaut, and a whole lot more. We cover those projects today, from his time as Section 8 to the Nardcore scene, the origin stories of Lagwagon, and the shaping of the Fat Wreck sound. We talk about many side projects, Joey's record labels past and present, his love for vinyl, and why his boxes are still in storage. We talk about when Lagwagon was approached by a major label in the 90s, the formation of Me First and the Gimme Gimmies with Chris Shiflett, Fat Mike, and Spike. Will there be more Gimmies records? And a whole lot more. <laughs> by the way, Joey and the Lagwagon bunch are headed down under New Zealand and Australia starting October 24th. Wellington, Auckland, Brisbane, Torquay, Melbourne, Canberra, Sydney, and Hobart. These gigs are quickly selling out, so secure your Lagwagon tickets now at lagwagon.com or sbmpresents.com. And by the way, there is an extended version of this interview only available to the legendary and extraordinarily handsome Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash vinyl guide. There's about another 15 or 20 minutes of this interview Plus, it's commercial-free and even in high resolution, so your ear holes will feel much better afterwards. Please head up there now, patreon.com slash vinyl guide. Help support this show, become a vinyl guide dead set legend, and enjoy all the extras, including more Joey, more lag wagon talk, more laughing, more record chit chat, plus a whole lot more benefits. That's patreon.com slash vinyl guide. Go there now. <laughs> And finally, since you got your phone in front of you, make sure you are following the Vinyl Guide podcast in your favorite podcast app of choice and enjoy free, unfettered access to over 400 other episodes and interviews, such as Bill Stevenson of Descendants, episode 416, Peter Hook talking Joy Division Records and more, episode 412, Ray and Blackie of the Hard-Ons, episode 398, Jay Maskus of Dinosaur Jr., episode 393, the legendary Ross Knight of Cosmic Psychos, episode 385. Chris Shiflett of Foo Fighters and Me First in the Gimme Gimmies, episode 382. We even had Spike of Me First in the Gimme Gimmies, episode 376. And literally hundreds more. Follow us in your podcast app of choice and let us annoy you the moment a new episode becomes available. And with that, let's get into our conversation with Joey Cape of Lagwagon, Bad Astronaut, One Week Records, and a whole lot more. Hello, well, that Nate. Was like a big cup of coffee there, or what is it? It is coffee, and ah. yes, it's large. I had to go for it because uh, it's been one of those days. Been up since very, very early. Although it's pretty early there now, huh? Yeah, got, um, yeah, six a.m. 6 a.m.? Oh, very good. All right. Man. You're already on Australia time. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I woke up at 6 today, which isn't, yeah, I got to start sleeping in to get on your time. So, Joey, you and Lagwagon coming to Australia, Brisbane, Torquay, Melbourne, Canberra, Sydney, uh, and a harbor cruise in Sydney. This is the end of October through early November. Uh, people yeah. can check out the dates and information, lagwagon.com slash tour or sbmpresents.com. You, you've got quite the fondness for Australia. It's clear because you know, you're, you're here quite I a really bit, you're playing it. quite a bit, you know, um, yeah. this, this podcast is about, uh, record collecting rare records, things like that. Ooh, are, yeah. are, are you, are you a bit of a record nerd? I so am and maybe was. So something happened to me where I kind of lost my footing in places to live. And it requires a really good room. I have thousands of vinyl records, you know, at least 2,000. I don't know. I mean, I've collected most of my life. The first record I ever bought was, of course, on vinyl because of my age. Seven inch, you know. 
Mm-hmm. And um, what was it? It was the Allman Brothers Ramblin' Man, which is so lame. The first record I bought with like my own money, you know, like wasn't like my mom buying me a record. Um, and my older brother going like, dude, the Allman Brothers are cool. Like when I kind of figured out what I wanted, it's, I don't know if this is more embarrassing, but I'm pretty proud of it. It was Hemispheres by Rush. Mm-hmm. You, you know, this album, I bought that. And then this next one was, I think like an ACDC album. I mean, I was into rock music and I wanted the guitar pipers to be able to play and that kind of thing. Um, a lot of metal and then later punk. And lots of cheesy pop music. I mean, I have, you know, I've, there's a lot of ABBA and Carpenters in my collection. You know, I have everything. I, I'm in the country, what, whatever folk music. Of course, that's what you do when you start collecting records because it's so fun. Yeah. Um, but the drag is they're all in storage and they have been for years. Oh. So when I meet someone who's clearly an avid record collector, I'm looking behind you. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's just the downstairs stuff. <laughs> I know. And so you're like 2000. That's cute. no, I know. Uh, but it's, <laughs> it's, it, it, it's kind of, it's almost problematic, Joey. <laughs> yeah. It, no, it is. And I love it. And I want that problem. I it's the next house. You know what I mean? Cause this house, there was only one room. Uh, and I built this, this is my recording studio. I built a little project mm-hmm. studio in here. And, and this is kind of a little more important cause it's like, my work you know it's what i do and it's what i really love and so there, there wasn't room for that but hopefully you know the next place I'll, there'll be an, a, an extra room you know mm-hmm. okay yeah do you have a turntable setup do you have some of them or are they all just kind of they're in the all box? in storage i haven't had a turntable set up since i moved in a panic at the beginning of the pandemic i moved in with you know i had nowhere to go when I came back from Australia on March 20th or something like that, it's just in the thick of it. You know, it was like a day or two later, we would have been Australians for a, co- a year or so. Yeah. And uh, got home and was talked to my mom, who's in her 80s and or was just entering her 80s at the time. And I ended up saying, well, I guess I'm going to live in my van. I don't really know how it works in a pandemic finding because i had planned to come home and look for an apartment you know uh, anyway the point was i moved in there i moved into a room my mom said no come live with us you know so i went down south to the town they live in and i never looked back and now i have my own place here um and uh yeah there's just not uh, there was the vinyl just had to go into storage yeah it just didn't have anywhere to go when I separated from my ex-wife, you know, that's when that all, that's when the vinyl problem started. <laughs> you got the it's record, she fault. got everything else. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I didn't want anything else. You know, I don't want that clunker of an automobile or, you know, that crappy furniture that we got at a thrift store 20 years ago. You know. Yeah. But my old RKL records. Yeah. Those going with me. <laughs> My shit's coming with me. <laughs> so when you were young, you, you, it sounds like you kind of got shot straight out of the cannon with Rush, ACDC. Yeah, we were a music family. My mom listened to all that singer-songwriter California stuff, you know? So all that kind of stuff was going on, that Mulholland Drive, or, uh, Laurel Canyon sound and all. That kind of music was, you know, Linda Ronstadt and all the Eagles and all that kind of stuff was playing on Creed and she was really into that, that those things. And so I, I, that was like in my blood from the start, the songwriter guys. And my dad listened to a lot of classical music, but also loved the Beatles. You know, I mean, he, they, he was uh, possibly a little more educated. There wasn't a lot of jazz in the house, which is kind of, that's too bad, but a lot of music, there was always music playing. And then everyone in the family was a musician. Except my mom, okay. but everybody else. My sister and brother were serious musicians. My dad was a serious musician. I'm the worst of the bunch, you know. But I'm the least. I'm the least talented. There's no doubt. I just got lucky. But there were lessons and stuff for you. Was that kind of, or did you just kind of pick it up bit by bit? Or I sort of just taught myself everything that I ever learned, and. I had breaks in the 
self-teaching, you know, thing. Like I went to, I think it, at some point I had been going to you know, a university for a while and I, I was just basically flunking out because I was more interested in the bands I was playing in. And I decided, ah, oh, screw it. You know, I'm going to study music. So I, I dropped out and I started doing, I did some trade school stuff. I went to like a sound engineering school and went to a junior college, like a, a city college, you know, uh, a state funded college to study music theory and piano and vocals and music history and all that kind of stuff that you do. And, and those things were pretty short lived too, because it always got in the way of me being in a band, you know? So I, I, I'm not really, I'm certainly not a, a educated musician the way some people are. Like I don't read music. I, I learned, I learned to read it kind of, and then just didn't keep doing it. So, you know, I was right. probably at the Dick and Jane level of reading music, you know, just really basics. Um, anyway, yeah, I don't know. I, now I'm studying now I'm taking guitar lessons from this guy nearby and I'm kind of trying to learn jazz, you know, stuff. Cause oh, I, okay. I feel like it's a hole in my knowledge and, you know, and I've been, you know, playing piano. Uh, I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about like, <laughs> you know, I, I can't, I'm not bragging. Yeah. Motley Crue home, sweet home level of piano. Right, I'm getting there. I'm, I'm like, I think I can play "Home Sweet Home" now. Okay, I'll have to try it. I'll have to try it. But yeah, enough to be able to play on tunes. You know what I mean? Like the last record I had to do in lockdown, and so I spent the whole time. You know, I had my stuff. You know, and I had it in her this tiny little room, and I just kind of sat there and went, "Okay, I mean, I can figure out what these piano chords do. I know a little." And there's always punching in, yeah. you know what I mean? So yeah. I try to play and get the feel and yeah, it's kind of funny. Yeah. But, uh, so now I'm trying to pick it up. So you, you're living kind of down South. I want to say Goleta, Ojai, the, that type of area near Santa Barbara. Yeah. That's yeah. Where you grew I'm, up? In, I'm in Santa Barbara now. Yeah. I well, Partially. Okay. Um, I moved to Santa Barbara when I was about, uh, I guess nine years old. Um, before then, I was farther south in California. Okay. In a town called Camarillo. So, growing up there, I guess the Nardcore scene was kind of oh, in yeah. your backyard. Is that, yes. How did, how did you get involved in that? How did you inject yourself into that whole, what was happening down there? Well, I didn't have to because I was in bands when that was starting to happen. You know, yeah. I mean, my original band used to play with Aggression, Dr. No, Ill Repeat, all those bands, you know. And that was just our scene. I mean, Santa Barbara was like the north end of the Nardcore scene. It's referring to Oxnard, but mm -hmm. there was bands from Ventura, Santa Barbara, RKO was from Santa Barbara, you know, um, Camarillo. So, yeah, that was just the scene in the early 80s. You know, that mm -hmm. was what we had here. And um, the, it was great. I mean, I, I, I was in the original incarnation of RKL, kind of. I had a band before them. I was really good friends with those guys. Um, you know, they were my age. I grew up with Jason and Chris Rest and Bomber. I, I met, you know, when he was 15 or something. I started kind of playing music with Bomber and Chris, and I was already playing with Jason and another thing. So I introduced Jason to Bomber and Chris. I said, this guy's your singer. Like, he's just nuts and rad, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, and they just, they started, I think the first thing they recorded was like a cover of Agent Orange Bloodstains. Mm. Bloodstains by Agent Orange. And they yeah. brought me the, de brought the demo tape to my house, but I was grounded. You know, I was on restriction. My parents, my mom, I was always grounded. I was kind of a bad kid. And, uh, they brought the tape over and it's, I just was like, holy shit, this works like this. They sound killer. And, um, you know, I was maybe going to be a guitar player in that band, but, uh, but you know, they just kind of had to move on with people that weren't always getting grounded in trouble. <laughs> and I was kind of over it too. I, I just kind of spent a bunch of years in the punk kind of scene here and or the scene here. And I was, I was sort of, you know, trying to kind of clean up my life a little bit. 
drugs and things like that. I was trying to get my grades up and, you know, I got sober. I was boring. So they didn't really want to have anything to do with me. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So I kind of checked out of that scene in like 83 or something. But you formed the band, what I believe is Section 8. Was there anything in between kind of tuning out of that scene and Section 8 that kind of made oh, you right. kind of boomerang back? Well, I guess college, going to school and moving up north. Um, I played with a guy from the band Victims Family when I lived up north. Originally, I moved to Santa Rosa area, and that's where mm -hmm. they were from. Um, so I still was kind of... And I still had friends, and we still went to punk shows um, and metal shows, too, as, you know, uh, like the thrash scene in the Bay Area. I mean, oh, okay. um, I stayed into music. I stayed playing music all the time. Music was always the demise of any kind of academic career I was going to have. Yeah. But, uh, but the Santa Barbara scene and the Nardcore scene, I completely divorced myself from all that because it, it was – pretty fueled by drugs and i didn't want to be around that you know yeah I mean, hard like hardcore drugs then or yeah heroin okay heroin. heroin was the thing you know so i don't know that wasn't yeah but uh yeah i don't know i forgot what you asked but oh okay <laughs> well <laughs> it's kind of babbling i'm sorry I guess that's all right no so you had it sounds like you had some fun adolescent experiences in the nardcore scene but then you decided okay you started moving away from which obviously people naturally want to put some distance in between themselves and that sort of kind of yeah. drama but you you stayed playing you knew you wanted to still have a career in music at that point or were you not sure i what did I did, but I by the time I was 20, I had accepted that it was going to just be a hobby. You know what I mean? By, by the time I was 18, I think I accepted, well, you know, guys like me are not going to, I'm not special and, you know, I don't have the abilities that a lot of the people I play with have. I think I can write a song. I remember just always thinking, I feel like I have a knack for songwriting, so mm -hmm. I'll keep writing songs. And then, honestly, the Section 8 thing, signing to FAT when FAT was nothing, they were just new, and um, knowing that we're going to make a record, I was like, wow, I'm painting houses for a living at this point. I've already kind of tried several different kinds of education, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Only thing I really like to do that educates you is read. Um, but I do not like to be told how, what to study and, and have deadlines. And, you know, I'm shitty at that. So I, you know, we did the album and uh, it's like, of course, I got to do this. And then we just got it was we were a very fortunate band. We got invited to tour in Germany and that went really well. And things just kind of went well for us. I mean, I think we just good timing, you know. Yeah. Now, did you meet the rest of the the Lagwagon guys in Santa Rosa, what UC Davis kind of area? Uh, no, thing? we were all Santa Barbara area guys. Everybody, okay. that band was based down here. I I I had come back down. Like I said, a few times I moved back down for a certain mm -hmm. amount of years. Moved back down long enough to begin that band and then moved back to San Francisco. Then moved back down for long enough to meet my ex-wife. And she was from the Bay Area, so we moved back. I mean, I, I kind of bounced back and forth for about a decade. And somewhere in there, Lagwagon became a band. Um, and in the early, early days of that, or Section 8, I should say, you know, I was here. And I rented, I had a, I roomed with two of the guys in the band. And, you know, we just rehearsed all the time. That's all we did. Um, so what was the reason yeah. for the change of the name, Section 8 to Lagwagon? That was silly. It was just um, Fat Mike just really, you know, he, he brought it up pretty early on. You know, I love the music and I think you guys are great, but I, I really don't like this name. And, you know, of course, because we were we were like, fuck you, man. It's the name of our band. You're not going to change my name, dude. You know, and we all were like, we're not doing that. Who gives a shit what this guy thinks? Like, you know, that's really what he was met with. And then what happened was we just started running into bands. We started doing little little bits of touring on the uh, the West Coast, you know. And there was a band in Portland called Section A that had like a seven inch called Drunk, Fat, and Stupid, the best of my memory. 
um they were a little more like a sloppy uh, hardcore band um funny you know i think of like gutter mouths of the vandals or something you know but not tight whatever um and people started confusing us for that you know i would we'd meet people would play a gig and somebody go i got that seven inch you guys made you playing that tonight it's like yeah we don't have anything on seven inch and that is not our song we played with that band or something you know and then finally there was a this is right around the time uh nwa and some of the hardcore bands are coming out of compton and and you know that part of south central los angeles and those guys i mean a bunch of like white kids you know in bands like rich kids on lsd we're not gonna mess with a with a band that has that name from that background that in their promo photos are holding guns you know what i mean like we were in a record store on tour and we saw this photo of a hardcore rap band holding guns and it just said section eight and i was like well that about does it i think <laughs> <laughs> yeah so lag wagon is kind of silly i mean we called um the van that we toured in for years, we called the lag wagon because it was often breaking down. We bought this crappy nine passenger school bus thing, which is more of a van framed differently. I mean, the frame of a van with a different shell. And uh, Chris was always fixing that, the big guy, Chris Flippin. And uh, so we called it the lag wagon, which came from my brother. My brother used to call my mom's station wagon the lag wagon because she was always late picking us up at school. It goes way back to my childhood. And everybody wrote down names. We all voted on a new name. And for some reason, that was the name that nobody really hated. So we just kind of went with it. And it was the album was already done. That's the drag. We recorded our album at Section 8. It's on the reels, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of had to pick a name and just do it. I don't know how I feel about it. I used to really hate our name. I used to go, what the hell, lag wagon? Like, this is a bad name. I have to explain it all the time to people. Like, you know, whatever. Yeah. Well, yeah, also the spelling. Is it one word, two words? Is there a hyphen? In fact, there's some releases. I think the first seven inch, it's two, two words. And then it's kind of had this evolution, too. Yeah. Two words until somebody drew a cool logo that was one word. And then it was like, oh man it's one <laughs> word it's its own word you know what i mean like get all excited about it uh yeah it's kind of funny you've had this tremendous uh, relationship with fat wreck and fat mike i, I and mm. I, i'd i'd go so far as to say that you know what lag wagon did especially in the early days helped really shape that fat wreck sound i think that there's a a, a lot of uh, lineage that people can draw from that scene to Lagwagon's early records. Is that something, you, do you recognize that? Am I just seeing things or? No, know? no, it, ha it has to be true because we were the flagship band, you know, mm -hmm. and we had, there were definitely elements in our sound that no effects was onto. I, Mike and I are about, about the same age, a few months apart. I'm maybe just three months older than him or something. And, and him and I grew up in the same scene. Mm -hmm. He was really into the hardcore band. You know, he was really into RKL. We both love Bad Religion, you know, and the OC bands like, you know, Adolescence, the LA band, Flag, you know, all of that stuff is mm -hmm. what we grew up on. So it stands to reason that we're kind of writing from a really similar perspective, which is probably why he liked our band when I gave him a demo. He was like, oh, this is a good first band for fat. Ended up being a no effects seven inch that went first and then maybe even the EP, I don't know. He kind of put, <laughs> we got put on the back burner for about a year and a half or something. Like that. We made our record in like late 90 or something and it came out in 92. And I remember being upset about that because in the interim, Pennywise first record came out. I was like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> we're falling behind. Um, no, but uh, yeah, so we were a part of that. We, we were a part of the catalyst thing, you know, and, and and the only difference I think between Mike and I as songwriters was that he doesn't like metal at all. And I love metal. And the guys in the original band and still, everybody in my band were kind of into metal. So we don't even, I've said it a million times, 
I guess you have to call it punk because people call you punk long enough. You go, oh, I guess we're punk, but we're not like the kind of punk that I was into. You know, we do a little of that stuff, but yeah, I don't know what the band sound is. I almost think it's punk. like a, a fast, a fast folk rock. To me, you could take any song and just you've got the drummer doing double time. If you slow the drummer to halftime, it's almost a, a folk song. You could, same with like Bad Religion Suffer, you know? Oh, yeah. It's the, yeah. You know, yeah. That's what it feels no, like. Hey, that's very nice to hear because that's exactly what I want. You know, I I like songs, you know, I'm a song guy. So it's really hard when you write a song that you think is like, this is pretty good song like i'm i'm kind of getting this going you know i i feel like I, this is something i could do and then the guys play it and it goes through that crazy fax machine or copy machine or whatever and it comes out on the other side and you're like what the fuck happened to my song <laughs> <laughs> dudes calm down so that's uh, interesting because you do a lot of the acoustic work you know that's, on the side that's and, why and, that started okay all right. I mean, part of it is that I never played piano as a, a youngster, so I wrote on a guitar. And, you know, you don't plug in an amp and crank it up unless you're Jay Mascus, you know? Like, I don't write the way maybe the guy from Dinosaur Jr. writes, you know? I don't know how he writes, or Thurston Moore or something. But I, I never plugged an electric guitar in and went, yeah, this is a riff. I can't hear anything I'm singing, but, you know, and I, I whatever. So I always wrote on an acoustic guitar. So a lot of the original incarnations the 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 you know original versions of these songs were demos i made on a little tape recorder and then i'd give it to the band what do you think of this song and then they and me would kind of tear it to pieces and make it into a lag wagon thing and after a while i just had ideas of how that worked but um mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting so later I started running into people saying there was this thing that started happening where people go, man, I really love that acoustic version of the song you did. Like you should actually record stuff like that. And I finally did. And it's, it feels to me also, correct me if I'm wrong, but me first helped kind of scratch some of that itch as well. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. You know, In the how, early how did, days. Yeah. yeah. How did, how did me first start? I mean, you, you were the one that kind of kicked off that idea. Yeah. I had the idea with my roommate, Chris Shiflett, you know, who's now gone on to the, he's <laughs> been in Foo Fighters forever. So, you know, he, he, he scored goal. Um, yeah. Uh, but we're still buddies, you know, we're playing together actually really soon because he does side project stuff too. And, mm -hmm. um, Chris and I lived together in San Francisco. We had a little flat and we, uh, I told him one day, I said, you know, I had this idea of doing all these cheesy 70s songs that I grew up on that I just love. Like, I still love all this Barry Manilow, John Denver, Neil Diamond, you know, all that stuff. I mean, I just, those songs are like in me, you know? And I feel like so many of them make great punk songs. I want to do this thing. And Chris was like, I'm in. So we kept this list on our refrigerator in, in the kitchen, you know? And it, it basically grew to the point where it, it was the first Gimme's album. It was that those songs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we started kind of arranging them together. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I should just note that this time period is about a month. The whole story. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. a, a, by the time I called Mike, we were a few weeks in to this idea and uh, called up. Well, we got to get a bass player, you know. I can play guitar. You play guitar. We need a drummer. We need a singer because we, I can't sing because then it's just going to be lag wagon. You know, we got to find. And then we were like, well, we should ask Mike because, you know, Mike's got a label and Mike's, you know, great bass player and called Mike. And once he got involved, it kind of all fell together because Spike was working as in shipping and receiving at fat. We were all really close friends. All of us hung out all the time. We were drinking buddies, you know, all of us and, and Spike, we all knew Spike was a gifted singer. And he said yes. And then Dave Ron, you know, he joined uh, Lagwagon not too long before that. So kind of fell were, together. Were you aware of Spike's singing ability? He seemed to be kind of, I know he's a character. Oh, yeah. and he, he, yeah, but uh, singing is, you know, that was kind oh, of yeah. what he was looking to do. No, I don't know if he was looking to do, because he's such a um, 
Spike's brain and mind works in very mysterious ways to a person like me. He's, he is, um, I think Spike can hear things that I'll never be able to hear. Um, and I think he, Spike may be one of those people who, it's sort of like people who have perfect pitch. I'm not sure that anything Spike's ever saying, he says, yeah, nailed that. I think it's, it's a little bit tragic because he may never be happy. But when he was drinking in the early days, when we go out drinking at, you know, like this German bar called the Alf Frankfurt, we used to go to this bar in the Tenderloin in San Francisco, you know, and it was a pretty sketchy place, but all these old German dudes hung out there and everybody would be drunk, super loud, and Spike would just, out of nowhere, just start singing Isn't She Lovely by Stevie Wonder or some Stevie Wonder tune at full volume. And everybody go, shut up, Spike's singing. And the place would go quiet. I mean, this is how we knew, you know. I mean, we'd hang out with Spike. He'd start singing, and you'd just listen to him. And me and Mike would look at him and go, God damn that guy. You know, because he naturally is a gifted musician. He's an incredible bass player. He's pretty much good at everything he plays. Um, so, yeah, that was kind of a no-brainer. We just had to get Spike really drunk when he did the vocals for the album because in the early, on the first record anyway, we were, you sound too good. Yeah. Have another drink. <laughs> Here's some more whiskey, man. Come on. Oh, that's so funny. You could tell the yeah. vocals, his vocals are, are much better on the, on the, on the second one. It's just first album made in like three days live. Just got Spike shit-faced. You know, he's out there, you know, the next record spent a little more time on, the, uh, you know, a little more money. And Spike's like, I'm not doing that again. Mm -hmm. But he, uh, he had the ability. It was there long before that. Uh, it had, had we let him sing the way he wanted to sing, I think, on the first. I mean, I don't know. I didn't even like to say anything about this because Spike might not agree with me. And I, I, this is just one person's memory. You know, what do they say? There's your truth, my truth, or mm -hmm. your ver your version, my version, and the truth yeah. somewhere in the middle. I don't know what the truth is, but that's the way I remember things. Uh, yeah. yeah. Were, you, were you guys surprised by the popularity of how Me First and Gimme Gimme's just kind of took off and, and the longevity of it to today? I was completely blown away. I mean, I remember when we took all those, se the, did the seven inches on all those labels, and they were like picking up and doing well, and I was like, well... You know, I mean, originally the band was formed to play for our friends. All of our bands had to always do all ages shows everywhere we went or else we wouldn't be a proper, you know, punk rock bands or whatever. Like, you know, we're not going to exclude kids, you know. So if we had to anywhere we went in the world, you had to say, is it all ages? We're not going to play if it's all, no bars, you know, even though we were well, we were well into our 20s, you know, we're all, you know, love bars. So the Gimme is really what the, you know, like we decided to form that band almost solely after the idea, just so we could play for all our friends in San Francisco at the bars we go to, the punk bars we go to. And uh, yeah, anyway, uh, it, it's funny because I, you know, I had no expectations of that doing anything. And then when we, when Mike had the idea of taking all the seven inches, the A sides, and recording a couple more songs and making a first album. Of course, everybody in the band was like, hell yeah. And then that album like outsold the last Lagwagon album that came out. I was like, what the hell? <laughs> We're not even trying. You know what I mean? This is not cool. What happened to my art, man? You know, like, I mean, there's a little part of you, like you're grateful, but you're also kind of, you know, it's a little bit like, well, I mean, I've been saying it for years. People like fun. With with me first in the Gimme Gimme's, are there a lot of outtakes? Do you have a lot of songs that you guys have done that never made the record that are just kind of sitting on not, tape somewhere? N not many, um, if any, because over the years where the band got more dysfunctional and we kind of stopped making records and stopped hanging out, everybody moved different places and, you know, the band kind of just became like yeah, every band, it seems like every band turns into that somehow. Um, I think we, we stopped being creative. Everybody had their own things, you know, like that they were serious about. 
Um, so the the holiday band started to just become less and less active. So we stopped recording, and I think during those periods, Fat Records released a couple things that were kind of like um, leftover stuff, you know, that right. they put together. Like there was something called "Have Another Ball." The first yeah. record was "Have a Ball." The B sides and, and whatnot. Yeah, that's all that stuff. That's all the stuff that we never really. Like we had to finish some of it, but it was like a day in the studio, you know. And I, I don't really know because I kind of stopped paying attention, to be honest. But uh, I think it's all out. <laughs> I think okay. everything we've done is out there. I know me for still tours quite a bit, but is there any thought uh, of more recordings at some future date? We'll be back after these messages. Well, hey there, record collectors. There's a new service available that specializes in record cleaning, restoring, sticker removal, and professional grading. VMGVinyl.com VMG Vinyl can help you make the most of your collectible records. From professional cleaning of records and sleeves, removing old price tags and store stickers, dry cleaning and rejuvenation of old shrink wrap to make it look like new, even providing you a professional play-tested third-party grade with either removal grading or encasing in plastic you have a wide range of choices at vmgvinyl.com buying a highly collectible record and you want it checked out by an expert vmg vinyl can do that too head over there now and see what vmgvinyl.com can do for you and your collection that's vmgvinyl.com the one-stop shop for professional third-party grading cleaning and record restoration that's vmgvinyl.com Oh, and hey, record nerds, don't forget to clean your records with the very best and safest record cleaner, the Groove Washer. Make your records look and sound their very best and store them with confidence using the new Groove Washer Groove Guard record sleeves. You gotta try this out. It makes a huge difference to the quality of your vinyl experience. Ask for the Groove Washer by name at your local record store and accept no substitutes. Or head over to GrooveWasher.com and use discount code VINYLGUIDE. 10. All hail the Groove Washer. That's GrooveWasher.com, discount code VINYLGUIDE10. Now we return to the program, already in progress. No limits. No limits. I know me for still tours quite a bit, but is there any thought uh, of more recordings at some future date? Well, um, yeah, and there's something in the works, but I can't talk about it. Okay. Isn't that fun? But I'll, I'll, ju I'll just be the horrible guy and give a teaser. And look, if it were up to me, I would talk about it. But I don't want to get in trouble. Um, but yeah, there's something going on. And But you know, it's different people now. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's Spike and, and, and whichever guys he's got these days. I've done a little bit of it. I did some of a Europe tour. And, uh, but, you were just in Australia last year, right? With the gimmies. Yeah. Yeah, I did that, and then I just did a little time in Europe with him. But this guy, Jake, from the band Strung Out, he's playing with them pretty regularly now. And, you know, it happens a lot that people in the band are busy doing other things. But, you know, there's some guys that haven't – I don't think Chris Shiflett's played with the band for 18 years or something like that. So he, he's never going to be back in that band, I don't think. I, it's I it's a little weird. I got the impression that Chris is – kind of really out of the gimmies. Um, I, it, oh, yeah. Whereas oh, yeah. there seems to be kind of this rotating cast of characters and people come in and out and even Jay Bentley played with them for a while, CJ Ramones yeah. around. But then Chris, it's, he seems to be, a, he, he's on the do not call list at the moment, it sounds like. Yeah, he's he, he hasn't been, you know, on the list of people to call for a long time. And, and you know, I don't know. He just... Uh, it's in one of the biggest rock bands in the world. I, you know, it's like, it's like I said, I think there was a point where we made enough records where it, we weren't really hanging out. There wasn't a, a lot of people got sober, you know, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't it, that, that it didn't really have the reason that it had before for, to exist for some people. So some people, Chris Schiff's, Schifflet's older brother, Scott Schifflet was in the band for almost the entire time. Uh, up until pretty recently, um, Scott was filling in for Chris, 
and actually never really became an officials gimme's re- uh, uh, member. And th- there's something funny about that. Scott's been in the band way longer than Chris was in the band. <laughs> you know what mm-hmm. I mean? And uh, I sort of come, I kind of go come play sometimes when I can. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sort of in, back and forth. I mean, I love CJ Ramon. I love John Reese. John Reese has been sort of the steady guitar player for a while now. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, Andrew Pincher. The people that Spike manages to get to play in the gimmies are great people. And just the coolest, you know. So it's uh, it's genuinely a lot of fun. I think at some point a long time ago, I started to think of it as a fraternity thing, for lack of a better word. I don't like that word. It has negative connotation. But I I do believe that it's kind of okay what the gimme gimmies, you know. I mean, Jay Bentley. I played when Jay Bentley was in the band, and that was that was awesome. I'm playing with a dude from Bad Religion who I love. He's super great. Brian Baker was in the band for a while. You know mm. how cool is that? I got to play with Brian Baker. It almost became a thing for me. Like, okay, I got to play with Brian Baker, C.J. Ramon, John Reese from Rocket, and all those other bands. It, you know, like it, it, the list is kind of insane. Mm-hmm. So, it sounds. I'm, I'm optimistic. There's a future where we'll. We'll hear some more stuff, but we'll have to talk about that another time, it sounds like. Lagwagon seems to be this the, a band that tours, then lies dormant for a while, then reawakens and tours. And if we're lucky, we get another record. What kind of triggers that reanimation of Lagwagon? I think there's, by the way, some misconception about how many breaks the band takes. Mm-hmm. We, we pretty frequently uh, tour, and we've only stopped touring God, I mean, I don't know if we've ever even gone a whole year without a tour. Because we do, we there's so many places to go in the world. And so the band has pretty consistently stayed on tour. The record thing's different, yeah. I think I think part of that may go because you, you've got a lot of other projects. I mean, you've had Bad oh, Astronaut, yeah, yeah. you've yeah. had a lot of things that, you know, you, it seems to be, and maybe that is the perception, a bad perception, but it seems like Lagwagon, it goes for a while, and then there, there's a break, and then you've got something else to fill that that void, and, yeah. and the others do as well. Yeah. So, Yeah, Lagwagon, the side project thing, you know, I mean, I don't know, I've maintained this point of view for a long time. I, I think any kind of art it it seems a little silly to start involving a gang mentality you know i mean i think if you like to paint or write or uh create music whatever it is that you're into um you should probably exercise all your needs there and um just enjoy doing different things sometimes a band because it's five people and there are five people that need to be happy can't collectively like you know take care of everyone's needs you know so hence comes the side project you know like the thing that you do and we only call it a side project because that's what people call it but to me they're just all things that matter i've always encouraged people in that i play with yeah oh you're doing that awesome good for you man i want to hear it you know, it's uh, it's a strange thing, and no band is immune to it. There's definitely always going to be the guy in the band like, well, I don't understand why you're out there doing this other thing. You know, don't you love us? Or, or you know, are you bringing your A material to something else other than this band? If you're the songwriter, yeah, you yeah. get a little of that too. Um, my problem has been very simple. As a person, I guess, a songwriter, I... I often have all these ideas that I want to, I want to try to do, you know, and they require a totally different kind of sound, you know, and music and, and style. And, uh, you know, sometimes you write something, you, it's just, I can't hear it any other way. It's got to sound like this. It's got to be this thing. You know, we can get into nuance after that but let's start with this you know and usually it's a band name or something like working titles are often you know for me i'll call something like i don't know sonic jr or something like i've got a song that just reminds me of sonic youth and dinosaur jr and it's like i need it to be loud and noisy and intense and and it's kind of got to be droning and whatever uh and i just want to try that at least so 
maybe you come to your band with those ideas and the other guys aren't feeling it or they, they're not even into the thing that's not part of their vocabulary. And that's not a downfall. There are things that they dig that I don't, you know, it doesn't, it's not in my repertoire either. So I just think it's a thing that should, should and does happen naturally and people shouldn't be afraid of it. And things should not be so precious because when things get too precious, that's when you start creating garbage. You know, mm. that's when you start doing things for sake of doing them like schedule. And so lag wagon taking a long time between records is probably my fault, but I don't believe in rushing those things. I mean, it has to feel like we need to do this. And that the one or two examples of when there was like a slight push to do something, you know, I feel like I can hear the difference. Mm. Yeah. I mean, my band, Bad Astronaut, my side band that I did, we did three records. The first two records were done in one thing, and it was uh, over about a year. And that was just all these songs I had written that I heard in a more instrumental kind of more uh, much longer songs and larger arrangements and mm -hmm. bigger, bigger composition um, involving other instruments. And th that that's that was born in a song called Owen Meany on Lagwagon. Let's talk about feelings where those guys have finished up the tracks, they split. And then I brought in my friend Angus, had him play cello and my friend Todd Caps came in and played some piano on, <laughs> on the song. Guys come back to the studio and they're like, what is happening here? And I'm like, doesn't it sound cool? Isn't it cool? Listen, it's great, listen to that cello. And uh, everybody dug it, but there were guys in the band that I think thought, um, and probably rightfully so. Like, I don't know if our fans are going to dig this, man. You know, we can change, but maybe we shouldn't change too much. You know, we got to be aware that are that we have a fan base, and you know, we want to kind of keep some sort of sound. Anyway, yeah. So uh, I realized after that tune, I was like, oh, I should just, I should be just doing other things. Right. And that's when I started to do a lot of other things. At some point I had like six bands and I was like, this is too much. I can't <laughs> yeah. write enough songs. Yeah. A lot of energy, a lot of bands, a lot of projects. Even you started your own record label around this time, I think, right? My records. Yeah. Is that around the same time. I, I, maybe my records was even, no, I think it's about the same time. I don't know. You know, it's funny. I, I just went and saw the Pixies the other night with my friend Jessica, and she was my partner at my records. And neither of us could remember when we started the label. Oh, we, okay. could, we could not figure out what year it was. Could you remember why? Yeah. Um, I was always a person who liked to make mixtapes for people. You know, like if there was someone I was swooning in my early years, I would make a mix cassette for them, you know, and I'd go, I made you this tape, babe, you know, whatever. Like, it's so, geez. Um, and uh, I just always liked making, you know, I, I, it was a different thing then, you know, we have playlists now. It's it's so much easier that everyone does it. And it, now it's just too much a part of our culture for people to understand the romantic aspect of what it was. But And the fact it took a lot of effort to do it. It was really like, you know, yeah. it, it took a... a a lot of thinking, a lot of consideration, and then the it's mechanics to sit down and make one. Yeah, yeah, it's the the, the high fidelity uh, novel, you know, and then the movie with John Cusack. I I think that scene where he's making the mixtape is so good, and it really is that. It's like what song flows into the next, and 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 how much time in between the fate. You know, when do you? The, there's really like an art to it, which is not unlike when you sequence an album as well, um, and. I always loved it. I still love it. That's probably why I love the studio so much. It's part of my brain that enjoys this more than anything else. And um, yeah, I don't know. So I guess that's why the record label, because I, I just, I also found that because of the internet, that there was this sort of like opening in the pop power pop band world. There were like all these power pop bands and like pop punk bands and just these different kind of bands that I really liked the songwriting. They just couldn't get a record deal because it's like Weezer took all the juice for that sound. And in Southern California, there were a ton of Weezers, you know, 
not a, you know most of them weren't nearly as good as you know the songs weren't as good but there were a lot of good bands and uh a lot of power pop bands too and that mm-hmm. kind of thing and i love that kind of music so the first thing i put out had a worst title it was called happy males but the first thing i put out was a comp and that was just all friends of mine people i knew that were in bands and i was like hey you want to be on this comp i'm putting out they didn't have record deals so maybe a couple of them did mm-hmm. i think i got gimmies to put a song on there to help it sell you ended up having nerf herder on the on the yeah. label as well so they were on the first comp and then then i was like hey do you want to do a records for so they were the original band were you okay with being a label owner? I mean, it seems to be a very different muscle than a musician. Okay, so I absolutely despise the 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 managerial and uh, you know, especially like the social aspects of like keeping people happy and all that stuff. I mean, I was sort of the one to call people and talk to the bands and everything, and that can be pleasant, but the part of it where the dysfunction that just naturally starts to happen with like, you know, you go from being like pals to like, uh, what's happening with our record? What are you guys doing? And we're trying to do everything, you know, um, there's a lot of scratching just to get anywhere. And it kind of hurts because these are people you care about and you, you know, so I didn't like that. And then, um, and, and honestly the math, you know, the business and the math, um, it's not difficult. It's just not fun. Um, but my partner was really, really sharp with those with the things that I didn't have to offer, and she was, uh, she was, yeah. We kind of yin and yanged our way through that thing. Okay. But no, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't amazing. I was pretty happy when she said she was going to go to law school. <laughs> she, you know, she just said, "I'm going to law school," and I said, "Good." let's dissolve the label. You know, it was like, I was waiting to sort of say it. You needed a good excuse to yeah, back away from it. To yeah, let but, go. You, but you then start another one. You got one week records, which is much a totally later. different model. Much, yeah. much later. I mean, like year, so, so much later. And at that point, that was just, uh, I was sort of thinking like BBC sessions, you know, I, I do you understand? I just mm-hmm. really wanted to do a thing where I, people would come to my house and this was like self-indulgent to the max. You know, I just really wanted to do the things that I want to do. I want to record. I want to work with one person and I want to get creative with them and help write. So do old school producing where you actually become part of the songwriting process and limit the time. So there's no time to, to overthink it. And it, it started out just sort of a fun thing. Um, and then, I don't know, people liked it, so I kept doing it. I think we've done like 21 of those. I haven't done one in years. year. It's been years. Um, and I have two partners with that, too. And, you know, they occasionally ask me, like, Are you ever going to do another one week, man? What's the deal? You know, and I, you know, a lot of it was pandemic, not having time. Um, and that's not, it doesn't make money. If I think if any of these things that I really, really love to do had done really well, um, I'd probably still be doing them more often, you know, but you, I, I have to have a day job too. You know what I mean? I have to do things that pay the bills. Mm-hmm. I have a kid, you know, I have, you know, I have people that depend on me, but I do love the one week thing. It's cool. I've been talking to a couple guys about sometime next year. Now that I got the studio set up, um, this, is brand new. Like I just finished this three days ago. So I'm, I, I recorded a vocal in here for a side project thing and I'm just about to start doing some recording. And so now I can actually do a one week again. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so we'll may see. revive it. So you had a few other records that were uh, self-released. I think doesn't play well with others. Um, yeah. The Liverbirds. When you do those, would you manage all the pressings of the records would you work directly with the uh pressing plant that sort of thing or is that yeah. someone business partner? yeah yeah it was pretty brief i i the first if you exclude the two splits with tony Sly that i did for fat 
Mm. Um, my first outing as like a solo guy was an album called Bridge. And I, you know, friends, labels that were friends, you know, um, mm -hmm. Bad Taste Records in Sweden, which could handle Europe. And then in the States, Suburban Home. I, I originally released that with them. And then, um, I don't know, I just kind of was looking at other people in my scene that were just doing it all themselves. And I was like, well, make more money and also I'll be in control and distribution's kind of whack now anyway. Who cares? I hate that word, whack. This, it's, it's, it's a screw. Dude, I'm so whack, man. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I can't believe I just said that. Um, yeah, things were funky. And um, I, I just thought this would be kind of a cool thing to do. So I did it for a few records and a lot of work. Um, mm -hmm. And then, I don't know. I'm a weird guy. I just wake up one day and go, you know what? This is the thing to do. And I did that. I woke up one day and I thought, I have all these records. I've gotten the record back from the labels because these labels have basically stopped doing that kind of thing. And it ran its course. So, hey, guys, just, you know. And uh, so I, I had all of these records and I was like, I'm just going to put them all on fat. Because mm -hmm. then every single record I've ever made is on fat. It's just was, was easy. There, was there an open invitation for you? What what your output was just to, to go to fat? Uh, yeah, I I think it was. You know, I didn't expect that. But when I went to to them and said, "Hey, you know, I've got like five records, and I know they're not all great, but they're all pretty good, and people like them." It's all done. The artwork's done. Everything's done. All I'm asking you is to give them a home. And I think I sell enough records that it, it would have been kind of silly if they said no, you know. But it was sort of a, it was a package deal for me. Um, you know, let's just, just take it all. And it's just easier. It's like, uh, you know, some of those records, I mean, I, I don't know if they're out of print or what. I, you know, I don't really pay attention. But uh yeah, they're all in one place. I know where to find them. I know who owns the master sink, you know. Okay. All right. So all yeah. that, because you've been across many different labels. So all of that still kind of comes home. There's not anything that's missing. Yeah. or okay. When I did other label things, I was licensing, you know. So okay. I, I managed to keep control of the things I did outside of it. It's the best of my memory. And with fat, you know, it's. I, I think maybe you can still call some of it licensing, but I don't see it that way, you know. It's just the, 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 if if a song gets placed and there's the 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 writer, publisher, master sync owner, you know, label. Those are the two sides, as far as I'm yeah. concerned. It's a shared deal. It always was, you know. If they do well, I do well. I, I like that. In the early '90s, punk was kind of becoming mainstream. I think this is kind of around the Green Day. Uh, time frame did, did Lagwagon get approached to leave fat and sign with a major once one time you would think there would have been more but mm -hmm. um and I have theories about that you know you never really know why it was definitely like a feeding frenzy you know just the same kind of thing that happened when Nirvana put out Nevermind uh, in Seattle like I it happened you know um and the result is things like Blink-182 and, you know, all those things, like that, you know. But, uh, yeah, we didn't get a whole lot of action. And, I, you know, I actually, why speculate? It doesn't matter. Um, I like that. I, I, I think for some bands, there was a lot of temptation to do something that, in some cases, might have ended their careers. And... Um, we were perfectly fine where we were. We was like the slow and steady wins the race thing, you know? I mean, we're all making a living off of music. Why? Why would we leave? And if we don't get too far out of the under the radar, you know, you you know, poke your head too far out there, somebody's gonna cut it off. I don't know, it's kinda how the human beings react to like popularity. I don't agree with it. I think it's bullshit, but I don't know. It was just kind of safe and it felt right. So we only got one offer. It was Priority Records. So I think at the time Ice Cube was running and we played at the Roxy in Los Angeles and 
So some guy showed up and I think he watched like two songs and went, no, and left. I remember somebody pointing him out. That's the guy from Priority. He's back there in the corner when the band before us played. And I remember thinking like, God, I hope he likes us and I hope he hates it. Like, you know, I don't know what I want here. And uh, when we were on stage, I watched the guy leave after like two songs. I watched him just like, and just like, walk, you know, you, you can see in a lot of those little venues. I watched him walk along the bar and go out the door to Roxy. And I was like, all right, well, there's that. And then never happened again. Good. I don't have to make a choice now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> With the album Hoss, you, you got the, the picture on the cover of the guy from Gunsmoke. I forgot his name. but his, um, Oh, no, no, no. Ban- Bonanza. Oh, it was a Bonanza? Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, Bonanza. Bonanza. Hoss Cartwright. Uh, right. Did you ever hear from the yeah. family or from the Bonanza? Yeah. Okay. It, yeah, we got it. Uh, well, the way that story goes is um, here in Santa Barbara, there was a record store. I can't remember the name of it, but it was sort of an indie record store. And they had done the end capping thing with our album CD which means like it was displayed in the front, you know, mm-hmm. out front. And the we feature. were getting, we, we, yeah, we were featured. And getting to that level, um, you know, this is the first time. It, this is our third album. There was enough hype. It shipped and uh, it shipped enough to, to do that. So we got the end capping thing here in Santa Barbara. And Dirk Blocker, who's a pretty famous actor, is the son of Dan Blocker, lives, he lives here or he did at the time. And uh, our guitar player, Sean Dewey, our old guitar player, he was in the band at the time, his mother, uh, they both were in the record store. And she's holding the CD, and he's holding the CD right next to her. And she looks at him and goes, "That's this is my son's band. And he goes, that's my dad. And that's what happened. You know, it was like... And, and, and so, oh, oh you, you know, your dad, you know, and then it was like, yeah, my dad was on Hoss and like, I don't think your son's band got permission to use this photo, you know, like it kind of, so, uh, the dirt, the Dan Blocker estate, who's the actor who played Hoss, they contacted, uh, they found their way into fat records, contacted fat and, uh, and they were so lovely. They were so fucking cool. I mean, I don't know if it's because this sweet mom was like the, how Dirk found out and maybe Dirk went to family. You know what? There's a little band and I met the mom and let's not crush these guys. You know, let's not do a cease and desist. But they didn't ask us to do a cease and desist. They listened to the record. They liked the lyrics. They thought it was semi-positive and I'm not sure why or how. You know, some songs are pretty sad. Um, so they let us pick charities to donate, uh, a portion of the proceeds. And to this day, there are two charities that benefit from every record sale of that album. One of them is food, not bombs, which I believe still exists at least in, it it may have turned into something else, but you know, it's a, it's a, it's a food uh, mm-hmm. charity and the other is um uh the it's like surf rider foundation but it's a clean water california thing you know it's like oceans you know clean mm-hmm. water ocean thing i haven't seen this in so 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 many years that i can't remember the name of the clear water company that you know was about we were all like surfers and skaters growing up so we were like they let us pick. We suggested this food not bomb. It was a pretty small organization at this point. And then the 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 surf rider found it, whatever that was called. I don't know why I keep thinking Clearwater, but that was like some other shit. And uh and they were like, cool. So it's like five percent goes split in half, goes to these two things, and they let us keep the album. We didn't have to pull albums or make a new cover. And- wow. That's lovely. Mm-hmm. So to this day, if we buy a copy of Haas, a little bit of that money still goes to those charities. Yeah. It's still. Yeah. I, I checked a while back with Aaron Burkett, who runs Fat, and, and I I just said to her, hey, uh, can you look? I, I'm so curious. Or maybe it was Bart 
who's manages, you know, and I, yeah, I went, I, I checked like a year or so ago and probably in my boredom in lockdown or something, you know, it was like, Hey, can you look, is it still? And yeah, still happening. So who knows, you know, it's kind of forever, I guess, which is so cool. That is. Oh, if the man. world can only be like that all the time. I mean, they were, you know, that just doesn't happen. Normally people go, you know, how do we cash out? <laughs> and we deserved it. We've, we deserved it. You know, you don't just wander down Hollywood Boulevard while you're playing a gig and go, we need an album cover in some tourist shop. And then the bass player, Jesse picks up this picture of Haas and goes, cause we all watch Bonanza and our little, TV that we had in our van with the video cassette thing. We used to watch Bonanza because everybody liked Bonanza and the band growing up. And he's like, dude. And I was like, that's it. That's our album. Like, I mean, you know, what? <laughs> we don't own this photo. We don't like, I, I, we were just dumb kids, you know? Okay. Joey Cape, thank you so much for coming on the show. I've always wanted to have you on. Uh, I want to make sure everyone knows Lag Wagon is coming to Australia. October 27th, starting October 27th, Brisbane, Torquay, Melbourne, Canberra, Sydney. And then on November 4th, there's a Harbor Cruise in Sydney, which I think is already sold. Some of these shows are already sold out. And then there's a there's a show in Hobart, I think, on the 5th. Check uh, lagwagon.com or sbmpresents.com to see if there are still tickets available. A couple of the shows have already sold out, so get in quick. And again, Joey, thank you so much for coming on the show. And we look forward to you down under, mate. Yeah, Nate, thank you so much. That was fun. All right. Well, here we go. Another hero on the show, Mr. Joey Cape. I always knew he'd be great on the show and finally got that opportunity. And man, did he not disappoint. Um, by the way, there's an extended version of this interview available only to show patrons. Patreon.com slash Vinyl Guide. Of course, it's commercial free and high resolution. You get all the extra knickknacks that a Patreon supporter would. Please consider supporting the Vinyl Guide podcast at Patreon.com slash Vinyl Guide. And also make sure if you are in Australia and New Zealand, you check out Lagwagon on their upcoming tour starting October 24th. Tickets at lagwagon.com or sbmpresents.com. And that's it for this episode of The Vinyl Guide. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please share these episodes on your social media. Put them on Facebook, tweet them out on Twitter, put them in the Facebook groups, the Reddit forums, whatever you can. Just help spread the love of The Vinyl Guide. That is so appreciated. And we'll be back shortly with a brand new episode. So until we talk next time, get out there and buy some records, people. Cheers. That's it for this episode of The Vinyl Guide. Send your thoughts to Nate at thevinylguide.com or follow or tag us on Instagram at Vinyl Guide. Until next time, keep spinning.